Hello there, and welcome back to another episode of The Close Read, the official podcast of the Claremont Review of Books. I'm your host, Spencer Claven. I'm the associate editor of the CRB. And as always, it's my pleasure to bring you a few interviews with authors from the latest issue as a way of delving deeper into some of the topics that are raised in the material that we publish. It's uh, always a pleasure to be doing that. Uh, it's especially a pleasure today to be joined by my friend James Poulos, who is what we call in-house talent in the sense that he is a colleague here at Claremont. He's the executive editor of The American Mind, our sister publication, the online publication. And that is appropriate because James, in this issue, which is the spring 2021 issue, has the cover essay, one of a pair of cover essays on big tech and the future of self-government. This is obviously a major issue in the news, but we've tried in this issue of the CRB to provide a couple of approaches to thinking about the predations of companies like Facebook, Google, Apple, Twitter, in a way that goes deeper than just the headlines. So if you check out Daniel Oliver's essay, which is about the limits of antitrust law for dealing with the anti-competitive behavior of, of companies like Facebook and Google, you'll get uh, an in-depth reflection on the legal ramifications of this problem. And immediately thereafter, you'll turn, should turn to James Poulos's essay, which is called God and Man at Google. And as the title implies, it's a cultural, spiritual, and uh, philosophical reflection on what the advent of digital technology has meant for us anthropologically as a species. The book is, or the essay rather, is technically also a review of a staggering number of books. Uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven books reviewed in the course of this essay, but it also works out an argument that I think our readers will will find illuminating and be be glad to track about what digital technology has done to us as humans psychologically and what sort of impulses it has awakened in us. To give you a sense of the sort of historical sweep of this essay, I'm going to start by reading from a paragraph pretty early on in the first page of it, and then I will bring James on to tell us more about his thesis. So uh, James writes, the power of imagination, which dominated the pre-digital world of electricity and television, has faded in the digital era. America's prominence in the 20th century was increasingly burnished by a cult of make-believe. Visionary artists like Disney and Gene Roddenberry, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg exported glossy narratives and fairy tales around the world in televisual form. Gradually, these narratives, that America is the strongest nation in the world, that we can do anything and be anything, ceased to correspond to reality. We hit limits beyond imagining. At the same time, digital technology began putting everything on record, dispelling the illusions we tried to construct for ourselves. Degra disgraced governors caught out in scandalous defiance of their own COVID lockdowns, cell phone footage of riotous city streets, proliferating images of a capital surrounded by razor wire. Claims of America's strength were now undercut, by innumerable records of missteps, shortcomings, and failures. James, first of all, it's great to see you and talk to you as always. Welcome to the show, and thanks for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and especially to talk about such uplifting things as these. <laughs> Indeed, and there, there is, in fact, I, I would say, hope in this essay. Um, you have to work through it and understand. You kind of have to get the bad news before you get the good news, as G.K. Chesterton remarked of Christianity. And so I'd like for the uninitiated, for those who are maybe not used to thinking about digital technology as a sea change in, in, in media technology and in our relationship with tools and, and with media, um, you talk in in the opening here about imagineering as kind of the dominant mode of thought and action in the pre-digital, that is the TV era when t television was the dominant media for communication. Can you tell us a little bit, I mean, this is a, from the Disney co company, this, this word, but you think of it as something much bigger. Can you tell us, our audience, a little bit more about what imagineering is and why it was such a powerful tool before digital came along? Sure. So... Uh different kinds of tools that we create technologically um, extend our capabilities in, in different kinds of ways. And so some of our senses and some of our faculties are sharpened, others are dulled or pushed into the background, 
Um, this is just a generic feature of life with any kind of technology. Really, it doesn't have to be digital or electric. Um, you know, you can go back to like print technology, the technology of the printing press, or back back still further to you know the invention of the alphabet, which was a huge uh, technological leap in its own right. Uh, and then before that, to sort of oral technology. So you have these waves of technological advancement writ large, and they do, you know, shape our uh, cognitive and our communicative environments in different sorts of ways. I mean, you, so, can find, you can find reflections on this at the shift from oral to written technology, for example, right? In Plato, the way that it will, things that it will do to our memory to be able to write things down, for example, is... Exactly. You can, you can think of, uh, you, you'll remember better than I will, which specific passage uh, in, in Plato it is where uh, Socrates complains that uh, written language is sort of like trying to have a conversation with a statue. You know, you, right. you, you might be able to hold up your end of the conversation pretty well, but there, there are limitations to what you can get from the other guy. Um, yet, nevertheless, you know, Plato persisted in uh, in, <laughs> in writing dialogues and yeah. uh, and they still, you know, they still have uh, uh, powerful resonance and relevance today. So, you know, you get not only changes in um, in in uh, in media technologies, but you get sort of compound or cumulative changes. Uh, so when you look at digital technology today, it sort of contains all the other previous media you can you know jump on your computer and you get video and you get audio and you get text and you get sort of all of the things that used to be uh powerful media in their own right which would totally shape our world in certain ways they're all sort of condensed compacted into digital which is one thing that makes it so so powerful and has so much uh, authority over our lives uh so you know that that all said um if if digital technology is really defined by the power of of machine memory if the ability of machines to uh, record things and recall things um, on a scale and, and with an intensity that you know was was definitely um, uh, beyond imagining in uh, in decades and centuries past, uh, then the uh, the the noteworthy features of televisual technology, you know, TV, movies, were that they really heightened our sense and sensibility around the imagination. Um, if you could visualize something through the power of the imagination. Then that gave you a certain kind of advantage in society, uh, one that that gave you a certain kind of control over the masses, um, and one that ultimately rose to a level of of rule um, in America and the West, and and uh, to a large degree over the world. Um, and as time went on in, in the TV age, uh, people became quite uh, explicit and intentional about this. Um, you know, you can think of the way that the U.S. waged a sort of uh, Cold War culture war, where it was, you know, it was Hollywood, it was our movies, it was our TV shows, it was the products of our entertainment industry uh, that, you know, that that captivated, captured the imagination of people behind the Iron Curtain. Um, so, you know, these tools can always be used for good or bad or for kind of neither. Um, but the important thing is, uh, you know, the uh, the the mode of rule or the mode of organizing. Um, and inspiring and motivating uh, large numbers of people in America during the TV age uh, was was very very much televisual. What happened on screen was more important than what happened off. Uh, the the power to move minds to shape the way people perceive things, the power of propaganda, um, all that stuff flowed very naturally out of uh, the medium of television. And you know it's it's for reasons like that that Marshall McLuhan famously said the medium is the message. Uh, you know, the message of the medium of television was, if you can dream it, you can do it. Uh, whoever imagines best is going to be the, the most powerful or authoritative. Um, and then that ultimately, you know, the imagination became a, a subject or a, um, a resource for, uh, for science and for technology and for the will to exercise itself upon. Uh, so so, that, so hence, hence, hence the term imaginary. Right. Right. I mean, in some ways, the major figure or a, a major figure of the kind of uh, communication you're talking about is is the ad man, right? Is the guy who can so perfectly construct an imaginary scenario that he makes you do the thing that he wants you to do. I mean, is that a, a fair assessment? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's a line in uh, in the TV series Mad Men where the uh, the protagonist 
Don Draper says to uh, one of the many women who passed through his lives, what you think of as true love is something that we, that I cooked up in a, you know, in, in a meeting about mm -hmm. pantyhose. Yeah. Um, so yes, there, it was, uh, you know, and, and it was, it was not just Madison Avenue and Hollywood, but uh, you know, it was the, the DC culture of spin doctors and, you know, journalists who saw themselves not just as reporters, but as something more than that. Um, and even all the way up into uh, up into Wall Street, where you know increasingly uh, during the '80s and beyond, and you know immortalized in in Scorsese's movie about Wall Street, The Wolf of Wall Street, um, these these figures became you know people who who wanted to seize uh, the imagination through the the use of manipula manipulation of money. Uh, you know, you can I think pretty clearly see that in in commentaries on uh, on on Wall Street culture, such as American Psycho. You know, where the line between the fantasy and the reality was really blurred away. So something that I'm often at pains to express about the experience of, of being online, the, the experience of living a lot of your life on social media or, or just engaging a lot with digital technology that I think your essay really, really gets at, um, that is sometimes very difficult to capture, is that this te television scenario where the fantasy is kind of boxed off. As you said, what happens on screen is more important than what happens off screen. Whatever you can get into that 50 second ad spot or that two hour movie, it doesn't matter what's on the outside or the fringes that was messy and, and that kind of undercut your fantasy because all that was going to be seen was just this forward facing product. And something like digital technology, especially something like social media, where you're constantly capturing off screen, backstage, impromptu moments. It, I mean, it really kind of blows the door off of that uh, ability to prepackage your, your fantasy. Can you talk now a little bit about what that has done to our ruling classes, to uh, really the American people in, in general, to have those doors blown open? The first big indicator to me personally that this phenomenon that you're discussing was real and had already been setting in for quite some time uh, was when I uh, attended one Super Bowl party um, hmm. at a certain point. Uh, and it was the first Super Bowl party where I saw a, a high definition television. And everyone on screen looked incredibly different than they did when you watch a low definition television mm -hmm. and oftentimes different in a not particularly flattering way. Um, you know, the first time that I saw a presidential debate in HDTV, you know, you look at these people and you start to notice things that you would not notice in the past. Uh, the, the granularity of detail, the sort of unforgiving, uh, you know, uh, uh, resolution quality. And, um, and it occurred to me that, you know, we had reached a point in the development of televisual technology where, uh, where the camera had, had suddenly become less flattering. Uh, you hmm. know, there's it knew the old, more than we had planned for it to know, essentially. That's right. And it's telling us more about the people on television than they wanted us to know about themselves. Huh. Uh, so, but there's no question that, you know, the, the social media as we know it is really more properly understood as a televisual technology push to its furthest extent than a digital technology, which is all about machines and what they can remember for us. Uh, you know, social media, the premise of social media really is that you can be both the the old man yelling at the cloud and the cloud itself you know yeah. you can be the the armchair uh political junkie sort of yelling at, at bill o'reilly but you can also be bill o'reilly at the same time and in fact you know this spirals out even further you can use social media to create any number of uh, of alternate accounts uh you can even converse between these personas so that people don't suspect that you're all of them um, and each different persona can sort of create its own ecosystem of, of arguments and post its own streams of content. Uh, not only can you be the person on TV, you can be uh, the, the television studio or indeed the broadcast network. Um, and, you know, some people, some of whom we know personally, have done very well in, in uh, taking advantage of those tools sure. uh, to build uh, real alternatives to the cable TV system as we knew it. And certainly to, you know, broadcast television where you had three channels and you had three newsreaders and what you got off of the screen was the news and there was no arguing about it. Right. So on, on one level, of course, this provides tremendous opportunity to kind of circumvent the officialized narrative, right? The thing that MSNBC, uh, CNN and the New York Times want you to know, right? You suddenly the, the like veil is lifted and you see backstage. Also, as you say, it creates a, a number of uh, 
really quite unhealthy and, and, and deranged and deranging phenomena like the people who invent multiple personalities and talk to themselves online. If you've ever been on Twitter, you've maybe been attacked by trolls who are all the same person. It's like five different people, but it's all the same person. Um, so we have a, a, a sort of monumental historical phenomenon, which is this shift from one dominant form of, of media to another. And then we also have, and your essay is quite uh, articulate about this, a spiritual or a social phenomenon. And that is the rise suddenly of religious conviction of both traditional and especially non-traditional forms. Wokeness is the great example, right, of, a, of this sort of new dogmatic faith. You must obey its creeds. You must kneel before its gods. You have to, you know, pay respect to all the different saints, to George Floyd, to, to Anthony Fauci. Um, and there is a connection between these two things that is not immediately apparent, but is profound. Can you draw, can you connect the dots a little bit for us between this sort of change in, in medium and this uh, emerging kind of focus on religion? Well, so there's a, a classic film back in the day um, called uh, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. And mm -hmm. the film begins with this sort of annoying uh, reporter demanding of uh, of a, uh, I guess at, at that point in time, a, a senator who had a, a history with a, a small town, uh, to tell the true story of what happened, you know, one day back when when he emerged from small town status to something larger. Um, and the movie is the bulk of that story being told. Um, and at the end of the film, uh, we're left with this haunting phrase, which is uh, "print the legend." Um, and the idea is that, you know, sometimes for if you really want to know the truth, you have to begin with something which is perhaps not really the truth, but is something that has more of a kind of poetic power or force, something that can uh, that can convince without persuading to use Rousseau's memorable phrase. Mm. Um, and so I, you know, I would say that what we saw in in the era of TV dominance was a sort of collective agreement that illusion was simply more important than reality. And that, you know, even what you saw on screen was not in fact a smoothly moving image at all. Um, you know, in, in, in the early days of television, it was, it was not even in color. Uh, after colorized TV, it was still really sort of a rasterized screen with blobs of colors flashing at different times to create the illusion of an image. Uh, and of course, as you know, as as infamously lampooned in the movie Fight Club from 1999, um, even a movie isn't a smoothly moving image, it's frames. And mm -hmm. those frames can be sort of snipped and played with and edited in certain ways. And we all know that what we're seeing is not really what's happening in real life. It's it's a sort of trick that presents these images as real in a way that convinces our brain in some way that they are real. Uh, and yet, in spite of all this, um, it was of the essence of the TV era that people came to recognize that those illusions were more powerful and consequential than, uh, than reality. And the goal of many people became to succeed at the level of that illusion rather than succeeding at the level of reality. Uh, and nowadays, um, now that, that television is sort of losing that, that mystique or, or charisma or enchanted power, uh, you see what's happened to many celebrities, and this was really dramatized once the pandemic got going, which is they were reduced like everyone else to just another sort of, you know, face in, in the Zoom box, um, yeah. you know, talking about normal things and, you know, begging for attention and feeling lonely and, you know, not maybe looking quite as presentable as they did when they were immortalized on the silver screen. So, you know, all of these forces have been unleashed by the power of a functionally infinite number of machines, many of which in our interactions with them are basically invisible, flying all over the world, uh, being able to be everywhere at once, properties that we used to attribute to, you know, only to angels, to angels and demons. Those were the entities that were, that were not corporeal and that had these powers that were beyond what human beings could do. And now suddenly it's our own creations, our own tools that have reached this, this quasi divine level of capability. Uh, right. and, and you, you begin the essay with a really striking quote from the rock star, David Bowie, who was asked, what was it was in 1999, I think, you know, what, what's 
what is digital technology? Isn't it just another tool? And he said, no, it's an alien life form. This invasion, this alien invasion of other beings. I mean, uh, this, this reality thing is, is something I'd like to draw out, actually, that, uh, you know, on the left and on the right, there is this language, slang language that weirdly mirrors itself because you would think, of course, that the left and the right would be having completely different experiences. In fact, they're having the same experience, which is the experience of waking up. The, the woke metaphor originally, right, is that you had been hoodwinked in a certain way to believe that America was just. And now you've woken up and you realize that no, America is, is racist. The right wing metaphor is the red pill, which is a metaphor from the matrix that when you take the red pill, you wake up out of this constructed reality and you find out you know, just what's actually real. Um, you, do, you, do you get the sense that that sort of return to reality, the desire for reality is motivating the, the religious impulse too? Well, that's right. So to, to complete the image, <clears throat> we're confronted with uh, machines that behave in, in what strikes us, you know, deeply and instinctually as a supernatural way. And the, the triumph of those machines over our world uh, on a level that now it seems clear that no human being or group of human beings can control the world anymore, certainly not through the power of their imagination. Um, this calls into profound questions, sort of the, the, the basic modern and postmodern answers to the ultimate questions about who we are and why we should bother being who we are and um, what kind of, of practices or you know, what kind of ways of life make the, the difficulty of life, the struggle of life worth the trouble. Uh, and so in, in a quest uh, for answers to those questions, um, you know, despite the fact that uh, the, the trend lines on religion are don't look all that positive and in some ways are very confusing, I think we're beginning to see a very strong trend that is already spreading quite rapidly around the world. Uh, where people are turning to to pre-modern answers, um, and you know, and not necessarily all the way back to to classical Greece and Rome to to polytheistic answers. Although there are probably even a few people now who are kind of quietly wishing for the old gods to return. I think in most cases, you know, in the West, it's it's Christianity, and in other civilization states, um, especially China, uh, you know, I, I think in order to understand how people are responding, you know, trying to figure out how to regain mastery of these entities that have invaded our world, uh, they're looking to religion and they're looking for ways ultimately to, uh, to program our machines uh, to, to believe in our religions just as much as we do. I, I, another, another element of this is the sort of essential nature of our humanness, which is, of course, very related to what you're talking about, right? You want to know what reality is. You want to know also who you are and, and where you fit. And as you say, the bots now behave like angels and demons, which is a very discomforting position to be in, to have created this, uh, this set of beings that now seem to threaten to rule over you. Um, can you say just briefly in the in the time we have remaining, you know, the religion in its, at its best restores to us some sense of kind of what we are. It's you know, beings created by God, unique, distinct, uh, in in souled, having having souls. And I, I wonder what you envision as an ideal relationship between such a being and these these machines that we've built. I mean, what? What ought they to be? Since obviously right now we're in a bit of a dysfunctional relationship with them. Well, you're right to say that this religious turn reflects um, a desire and in fact a need to to re-encounter reality and to reground ourselves in reality. Uh, and one feature of that reality <clears throat> is the political. Uh, if you go back to Aristotle, and you know, I, I think this is one piece of Aristotle that has survived pretty much intact from the beginning, has never really been seriously challenged by anyone. Uh, which is that um, that he who does not live in a city must be a beast or god. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we could we could slightly edit that today to say that the the entity that does not need politics is either an animal or a bot, a beast mm -hmm. or a bot. And so the the challenge, you know, one of the core challenges that we face in figuring out the nature of our relationship at its best between ourselves and our machines is the realization that our machines not only have no inherent interest uh, or care toward us and our distinctly human concerns and feelings and emotions and souls, um, but they have no particular interest or, or basis for participation in politics of any kind. Um, and so if we want to preserve our humanity, um, we need to accept that the, the distinctions between ourselves and the bots 
go beyond the sort of anthropological level of we have souls, they do not, we are alive, they are not, we have bodies, they do not, we are incarnate, they are not, to, you know, to, to some more uh, well-developed uh, features of our humanity, um, such as we are political creatures, we are mm. political beings. And then on the religious side that we can really un only understand our identity and our difference um, and we can only really structure our, our interpersonal relationships um, in a generative and healthy way if they are mediated through our relationship with the divine. And so understanding these things, once again, retrieving that sort of pre-modern wisdom and understanding then what the nature of our machines are and how, you know, we... We're not going to reduce them to the level of, of slaves as there were slaves back in the old days, uh, but we don't want them to reduce us to that level either. So we have to find a modus vivendi and uh, we, need to, we need to return to um, uh, an understanding of our, our human nature as, uh, as, as religious and as political creatures uh, so that we can you know, reclaim our control over these machines, salutary control, and not try to outsource it to some other regime or, uh, or, or outsource it to, uh, to an administrative state, which is already showing signs of wanting to just retire from, from the real work that human beings do and assign justice as one more task to the bots. You know, that's not going to end well. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we should be afraid that that um, is a possibility that, that, that might take over the world forever. Uh, but I do think that, that people who try to go down that road will, will do a great deal of harm before their project ultimately fails. Mm. It's profound stuff and speaks urgently, I think, to questions that we, you know, we may not immediately think to ask and yet will will very quickly become at the center of, if not, they really are already at the center of uh, our, our, our statesmanship going forward. James, congratulations on this essay. I really commend it to our listeners and readers. I think it's an important piece of writing. It's the cover story once more on the spring 2021 issue of the Claremont Review of Books, which is sort of dedicated to or built around this these questions of big tech. If you are a subscriber, it should already be in your mailbox. If you are not, or if you prefer to read on a computer and participate in our ongoing relationship with the bots, then you can find it online at claremontreviewofbooks.com. Thanks as always to you all for listening. And James, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Close Read, a Claremont Review of Books podcast and a production of the Claremont Institute. Our publisher is Ryan Williams. Our producer is Jake Gannon. And I'm your host, Spencer Claven. Thanks to Benjamin Squirit for our music. If you liked this episode and you'd like to hear more in-depth interviews based on the Claremont Review of Books, please do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We're available on all major platforms. And if you'd like to support us, we encourage you to leave a five-star review on iTunes. Thanks again for listening, and we will see you again next time.